Good evening, guys. My name is Chris Copeland. I'm here with uh, William J. Flowers, a.k.a. Wild Bill Flowers, and Warren Dara the Geek, and we are TRU, and this is Podcast 6. How you going, guys? Fantastic. How are you, mate? Yeah, real well. Sorry, in that introduction, I forgot to mention that I was here with my good friend Al Kohol. <laughs> good old Al. He, he's wow. my friend when no one else is. <laughs> it's a pretty common occurrence, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a tear in my beer for you, mate. <laughs> in your beer? Your beer would be stale after 1986. True. Okay, there's a tear in my beard then. Yeah, that's probably a more accurate statement. And some remnants of, uh, of froth from a chai latte, no doubt. And, and a yeah. nest of yeah. red backs and things. <laughs> that statement was, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going it well then. <laughs> <laughs> so let's cut to the chase. <laughs> Enough banter that Bill can't hear, and we'll cut to the chase, and uh, we'll introduce tonight's topics. Yeah, let's do that. So uh, this evening, we're going to discuss uh, a suggestion that, or part of a suggestion that was made by Tina Murray on our FB page, and we're going to discuss the uh, magnificent survivor, Tiger Man's uh, recovery plan. We're also going to break some uh, fairly awesome news about TRU and we're also going to trial something quite different and do some interviews with uh, the founder of the Search for the Tasmanian Tiger FB group, Kristen Edwards. So it's got a fairly uh, diverse roundup for this evening, boys. Yeah, can't wait. Uh, we had a, a, a great session with, uh, with Kristen. She's got a really popular... Facebook page, really keen on the thylacine, so uh, um, a good interview there to share with uh, with everybody, so that everybody can get to know a little bit about uh, Kristen. Oh, sounds fantastic! So let's uh, jump into it without further ado. Uh, did you want to lead us out, Mister Dara, the geek? What am I leading out on? <laughs> so I'm guessing that's a no then. <laughs> Magnificent Survivor, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, the Magnificent Survivor. Thank you. Uh, so, pre plan. Didn't you yes. listen to my fantastic introduction? Yeah. You, you do know I'm going to edit you out. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening. Yeah, yeah. So, Magnificent, but, magnificent just, Survivor, Chris. Hang on, Warren. I just need to yeah. address Bill's comment. The fact he was listening, the fact that he could hear, was probably uh, the earth spinning off on a different tangent. Yeah, well, that's why one of the funniest things on uh, our YouTube channel is that uh, scene where Bill's got um, his hand up to his ear and uh, you know telling <laughs> yeah. the whole world how uh, yeah. how great his hearing is, and if it, if if something happens in in the forest, then his uh, well trained ears can pick it up. Uh, uh, so it makes me laugh every time I see it. I believe so. that. Uh, uh, so, Jeff <clears throat> sorry, guys, I didn't hear a word of that, but but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Part E, page 28, Future Protection and Nurturing, Warren. Yeah, so Magnificent Survivor. So this uh, particular ebook is written by uh, the, the Tiger Man, so uh, an anonymous uh, individual who spent uh, uh, a number of years and a lot of uh, money. The background to this individual is a little bit uh, uh, murky, and I Isn't believe... That a cool uh, mask? Yes, uh, or maybe no. Uh, a lot of the photos of him are actually um, are redacted in some way. Redacted. There you go. Use the word redacted. Number one. Uh, I thought if you were anonymous, you got to wear a, wear a cool mask. Yeah, and a cape. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so he's a, a, a businessman who was interested in the thylacine and basically set up a shop in Tasmania over a period of years, I think about six years from memory, um, in the, the late 90s, early uh, uh, 2000s, and went out and uh, um, searched the thylacine and then put uh, all of his, uh, I guess, case for the continued existence of the thylacine into print on the online book, and it's most readily accessible 
um, through the Thylacine Museum site. Um, it's got a lot of interesting sections in it, but the one we're talking about tonight is Part E, the future protection and nurturing of the thylacine. So this makes the assumption that uh, a recovery action plan is needed. Uh, someone's gone out there, they've found definitive evidence that the thylacine continues to exist and uh, what needs to be done to actually um, to protect it moving forward and in particular what immediate actions need to be taken. Well, straight off the bat, straight into the murky fox waters, the first one says increase funding for present and future fox eradication programs in Tasmania. Boom, right there. Right there, doesn't beat around the bush, you get straight to it. And on... this... Sorry Bill? When was this written? 05, 02, and then revised in 05, I believe. I... <clears throat> yes, the fox thing was just really kicked off about then, wasn't it? Yeah, yep. So at that point when this was written, uh, I think it was a fairly decent point. Yeah, look, and uh, as uh, we pointed out in an earlier podcast, uh, the official thylacine report changed in early 2000 to say uh, alleged thylacine and or fox uh, uh, report so uh, <laughs> it shows you uh, what was going on in the government's mind uh, at that time so so jokes aside I think it is absolutely vital for the continued existence of any Tasmanian native fauna that we protect the island against uh, infiltration by all invasive species let alone fox I can't yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Can't think so, of a species that would uh, devastate the fauna of this island quicker than European red fox. Yeah, and so when you think about what uh, that particular animal, Vulpus vulcus, has done to uh, mainland Australia and uh, lots of uh, native animals, um, you don't want to see that happen uh, in Tasmania. Gosh, no. Considering mm. that their estimate... Uh, I believe is somewhere up to 15 million red foxes on the mainland and currently zero in Tasmania. That's something that we really need to protect. Yeah, absolutely. So so the next point, uh, increased measures to control feral dogs and cats in Tasmania. Couldn't agree more. And again, just as a general conservation point for this island, uh, if fox doesn't establish and destroy something like eastern quoll and all of our other small mammals then uh, an explosion in feral dogs and cats will do it quite readily as well yeah so you'd think that uh, um guys yeah the feral dogs I understand that because they have direct com competitors for thylacine funnel to churn cats what would that be would it be a spread of disease competition like, uh, and toxo toxo yeah and competition you oh, can't okay. you can't have an infinite number of predators on a finite amount of prey oh, I wouldn't have thought the cats would take smaller stuff than thylacine but anyway so think, just explain Bill just explain uh, toxo for the uh, the lay person out there <clears throat> well uh, yeah I remember having looking after a marsupial and there was a cat in the vicinity and my marsupial just Killed over and died one day. <clears throat> Took to the vet and they said toxo. It's a parasite yeah, it's a spread in the feces of domestic and feral cats and it's uh, yep. rife in wildlife. Humans can get it. Uh, tends to make them fairly lethargic and it's fairly sorry, lethargic and it's fairly lethal. Mm. Yeah. That's why pregnant women should wear gloves while gardening, so they say. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so the interesting thing with uh, feral dogs is uh, from time to time when uh, we talk about feral dogs in Tasmania people uh, uh, are somewhat disbelieving that there are feral dogs uh, in Tasmania but uh, and we just give uh, a knowing nod yeah yeah well because you know we've uh, we've come across them on a number of occasions uh, out in uh, in the wilderness and you know there's certainly reports of feral dogs ever since uh, basically uh, the European settlers uh, arrived in Tasmania so I don't think the uh, 
the dog on the lead outside the pub counts, Warren. Sorry. Ah, oh, okay. Depends <laughs> the pub is. Well, it, it does remind me of that dog that uh, you thought was going to attack you outside of the Ooze pub that time, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> There's yes. no way to talk about the lady of Ooze. Actually, there's another story about it. Well, but we won't go into that. In no, this we, we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> that dog was fairly seriously going to have a crack at me. Yeah, well, you, you, did, you did have some potential dinner in your hands. I, so. I did. I was trying to be the good Samaritan and rescue an injured animal off the road, and the dog leapt off the ute and wanted to have either me or that animal for dinner. Yeah, or both. Or both. <laughs> Entree and main. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, I was uh, safely tucked away on the other side of the road, so that, that's all that was important. And unless you hear otherwise, I behaved in a very manly fashion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so it looks there, like... There was no squealing. Uh, there was no... Uh... Potential hush money to be... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so identify all causes of current high Tasmanian devil population. Well, Suggest responses. That that was written uh, early two thousand, wasn't it? Flat out mute point. There are no high sort of populations of Tasmanian devil any longer. Mm. And there was at the time. So identify the causes of the high. Well, if if you were looking into the eyes of uh, Tiger Man at Go. the time. Hey. If you were, yeah, yeah, you're going on. Sorry, I was just gonna say if you were sort of in the mind of the Tiger Man at the time, it would be sort of ultimately agriculture, loss of thylacine, in my opinion, roads, uh, yeah, sort of less less competition, more space, more game, higher population density of Tasmanian Devil. Mm, mm. Yes, so, so he's sort of saying basically devil's a, a competitor yeah that, there's a few why, why, why fire causes of high devil numbers you see just assuming that there are areas that's better for devils and not for thylacine oh absolutely i mean devil numbers increased over a hundred percent in certain areas between sort of the early 1900s and the late 1900s so I mean, it's fairly difficult to argue that devil numbers were high prior to devil facial tumour disease, but you will no doubt try. Yeah. So the the reason for that explosion in the population of the, devil is because they became the top order predator. Uh, they sort of became the largest predator. I'd be cautious in suggesting that devil is a top order predator. It's an opportunist. But, yeah. I mean, it had, like, in that time frame, you had the protection order on them. You had the cessation of the bounty on them. You had sort of forestry and agriculture clear a lot of uh, less than preferred habitat in the pasture, which supports more native game, such as paddy melons and things like that. You had sheep, which devils will eat uh, and kill. You had yep. roads in eastern Tasmania that sort of crisscrossed and provided another potential food source. You had gun control through tragic circumstance, so there was less uh, sports shooters and professional shooters putting pressure on a higher and higher prey animal population. In my opinion, it was a perfect storm for devil numbers to be historically high, just prior to devil facial tumour disease. Mm. And so you actually touch on a point that not a lot of people realise, is that uh, the thylacine bounty, uh, there was also uh, a concurrent bounty on, uh, on Tasmanian devil as well. And quail, yeah. Mm. So any any uh, carnivorous animal that could have uh, preyed on uh, on livestock was smashed. Yep. There is a good record of a very near extinction of Tasmanian devil under that same bounty system. Yep. True. So the the simple fact that you had a very high population density and you had very low genetic variants devil facial tumour disease stepped in and you're looking at an estimated 85% statewide loss to Tasmania devil since. Mm. So realistically, as a side, quick side point, that would potentially free that competition up now. So if the thylacine was out there in a remnant population, surely it would be easier for it to establish now 
rather than, say, 20, 25 years ago when devils were historically high. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess that's one of the real things about uh, a number of these books uh, that uh, talk about the thylacine sightings and the fact that the thylacine is still out there. You kind of get the hint that they, they think that this recovery is imminent mm. and yet 10 years has, has gone by uh, um, and, you know, still no conclusive uh, proof that uh, it's still out there. Yeah, and, I mean, ultimately, I think people can be guilty of thinking of thylacine as an independent species. I think you've got to look at all those animals in a sort of an ecology, and that ecology is not going to stay stable. If a niche opens up, then something's going to change, and as thylacine numbers collapse, devil numbers potentially exploded and as devil numbers are collapsing feral cat numbers are potentially exploding so it's just sort of availability of food and resource in my opinion mm. okay. I think this also goes into our next point about identifying all causes and impact of the endemic disease which is now affecting the Tasmanian devil populations which we know a lot about now yeah well uh, it, it says epidemic disease, but it is endemic to devil. It's, it's not going to jump species. It, there's no chance in my mind that devil facial germ disease is going to jump to any species, let alone thylacine, which is in a different genus to devil. Hmm. Um, confirm if this disease affects uh, other marsupial carnivore species. So I guess you've really covered yeah. that. Yeah. It, it can't. I mean, it's plain and simply it cannot. Uh, if we're sitting here in 20 years' time and there's a bazillion mutation strains of devil facial tumour disease, then it's less genetically characteristic to devil. It increases the likelihood that it will jump to other species. But at this point, there is no suggestion that it can, and there's been no observation of anything devil facial tumour disease like in any other species on the planet, which is what makes it such a difficult thing to deal with mm. Mm. including me yeah you're just difficult got, to deal with i know i got bitten by a, a tumor devil um well i suppose about 10 years ago now and i'm still here what's underneath that beard though bill yeah um well um <laughs> well um... now the secret's out <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't you love it like in, in a comic book you get bitten by a tumor devil and you turn into some wicked superhero and in reality either nothing happens or you get a nasty infection. Yeah. Well, maybe Bill does have superhuman powers. No, I think he's just got a nasty infection. All <laughs> <laughs> facial hair. Yeah, and so moving right along. <laughs> yeah, but a bum ching <laughs> Some specific land use changes. Okay, so here we go. Controversial. Place an immediate moratorium and all logging in Tasmania's virgin old growth forests. Yeah, this sounds controversial. You go. It's probably irrelevant, I'd say, because it's... Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd, yeah I'd, I'd like to see them not log our old forests, but at the same time, is it really the habitat for thylacines? Well, look, I, I think the that, is, might be. yeah, look, I, I think it's one of those things where where you think about what happens when you actually clear land and you know it's sort of turned into uh, areas where you've got more opportunities for herbivores to graze. So more herbivores means you know more food for for carnivores. So uh, yeah, so absolutely, I think like the valid point is that these animals need an environment to exist and you can't impact upon that too heavily without causing a lot of problems. But, I mean, um, the the logging didn't, wasn't the primary reason for the thylacine's decline. It would just be sort of potentially a secondary impact on them, surely. Uh, let's see, what's our next point here? Control clear fell logging or land clearing practices in all areas. Protect sensitive areas from all forms of habitat disturbance. What do we think of that one? Well, we sort of covered it a little bit. Um, where it says protect areas from all forms of habitat disturbance, I suppose if there's if we know where thylacines are, that might be a valid point, I guess. 
Yeah, I, I kind of think about things like mining and, and those sorts of things. And uh, I guess some of these things to me just don't seem realistic. And in fact, if, if anything, if, uh, you know, the conspiracy theories about, you know, the mining industry or the logging industry not wanting to the thylacine to, to resurface, it's these kind of uh, um, points that uh, um, would sort of add sort of fuel to that particular fire. For sure, surely mining is over too small an area to really impact upon a population of uh, animals with big range like thylacine or Tasmanian devil. Well, yeah, yeah, plenty of habitat out there. I guess we keep saying that. So, I'm interested uh, to get to the next point because this is yeah. a real contentious one as well. Oh, oh look, Christopher. Yeah. So it so, says, uh, halt the use of poison in or near bushland areas pending confirmation of total impact. It's right, so... Referring so to the, 1080 usage, basically. Yeah, so Chris, uh, as you say, controversial. Um, the impact of uh, 1080 poisoning on a large marsupial carnival, go. I think it's sort of difficult with uh, sort of thylacine because it hasn't been tested, but sort of bottom line, something like 1080 was developed because it doesn't accumulate in the carnivores. It metabolises, uh, where something like strychnine and arsenic doesn't. It goes up the food chain. And so a lot of evidence suggests that because the marsupials did evolve with the family of plants that 1080 was synthesised from, that they're inherently quite resistant to it, where things like fox and dog are not. So... I'm not sure how big an issue 1080 usage would play in management of thylacine populations. Okay, so let me just unpack that a little bit. So 1080 was used relatively successfully to control from the uh, um, 10 uh, the um, possum population in New Zealand. Uh, yeah, basically 1080. Uh, is a synthesized compound from a family of plants found in uh, Australia that is sort of highly toxic to introduced animals, uh, a neurotoxin off the top of my head. And whilst it's not a pretty way for an individual animal to die, it has been used fairly successfully in managing sort of feral dogs and foxes and as you said uh possums in new zealand so a brushy dies in the middle of tasmania from consuming 1080 mm -hmm. um uh, a devil or a thylacine comes along and eats that brushy very unlikely oh sorry it's likely that they'll eat it but it's very unlikely that it will sort of accumulate up the food chain because it's metabolized yeah i think um yeah i mean there's there's two ways of looking at this the 1080 may affect um carnivores may or may not but yeah no i was going to say the other thing is if if it's in a sensitive area and they knock off a lot of wallabies in that area reducing the population it would mean that the thylacine would have to move on from that area. Yeah, like 1080 usage. It's it effective. I mean, wallabies uh, are still with us and probably always will be. Has it been known to knock off vast populations? I suppose that depends on sort of realistically who you speak to and how dense they lay the baits and things like that. Um, like I don't think... like. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm not for the use of 1080, but there is also a lot of controversy over it, and certain stakeholders probably don't portray accuracy when they talk about it from what's actually known about the stuff. Yeah. Warren? Yeah, look, I think that um, that's sort of uh, my understanding. A lot of research papers out on uh, on this particular matter, so... 
I would have it a guess you're right. I think it's, um, A, it's not a good thing uh, in the first place uh, to have uh, an indiscriminate uh, poison out in the environment. But not at in all. Terms, in terms of being a threat to uh, a recovering or uh, um, a newly discovered um, uh, thylacine population, I, I think that's very low. And in fact, again, you know, bountiful... Uh, uh, conspiracy theories about uh, thylacines is that there are some people who say that 1080 is used to control thylacines uh, so that they don't uh, uh, recover. Mm, yeah. You know, certainly that seems to be um, a very, very remote, uh, um, uh, I guess, idea in, in my mind at least. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah. I, th I think the other interesting point of that is that... Um, yeah, some of our big tree farming places are sort of shut down, so it's probably not as much 1080. Not at all. Used. And I think from memory from 05, it was uh, I started to sort of move away from 1080 into shooting regimes and a few things like that as well. Yeah. So they have actually moved away from poisoning anyway. For sure. So in some ways you could sort of say, well, that uh, well, it hasn't halted all the use, but it's certainly... Uh, Minimised it. Back a bit. Yeah. Or a notch. Shall we go to the next one? Strengthen law enforcement in national parks and reserve. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Well, it depends on what they talk about here. If it's uh, um, making sure that, uh, you know, Bill keeps all of his clothes on within the national park, fully supported. Fully, 200% supported. Well, there goes all your Sasquatch sightings right there. <laughs> all gone. If it's about reducing the amount of uh, wood hooking that happens uh, out in the Tasmanian wilderness. <laughs> There's a term you didn't know the meaning of until you visited for the first time. Uh, abso absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, there's a wood hooker, as I get told. And yeah. Yes, okay. I'm just going to go lock myself in the car for the next couple of hours, yeah. Mm. So what? So what is a, a wood hooker, uh, Chris? Wood hooker is the device used uh, on the front of a four wheel drive to haul out logs so that they can be illegally cut up for firewood. So the practice of wood hooking is the illegal collection of firewood. Yes, yes. Which um, cool. there is, there's a fair amount that actually happens uh, allegedly. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, strengthen law enforcement in all national parks and reserves. Um, I can't imagine they're going to discover thylacine around the Dove Lake circuit at Cradle Mountain. So, um, realistically, like if the thylacine is extant, then it's probably going to be in more remote areas. Um, yeah, well, I wouldn't have worded it like that. I would have worded it like, you know, strengthen budget to research yeah. thylacine. In national parks, you know, law enforcement. I mean, what's I suppose it's you know, if you got a whole heap of yeah, geeks going out there trying to look for thylacines, yeah, you can shoot them off, couldn't you? Yeah, let's not uh, give geeks a hard time, Bill. No, no, yeah. it, someone might whip out a uh, a spreadsheet to support their geekness. That's yeah. right, and we no. don't want that. <laughs> No, you don't want that. Yeah. No, no. So moving on from government. <laughs> Move on. Move on. <laughs> Promote complete protection of all native wildlife in Tasmania. Uh, uh, well. Isn't all native wildlife by definition protected to a degree anyway? You've just got degrees of protected, uh, protectedness, if that's a word, like Paddy Mellon's been historically abundant or partially protected, so do you have sort of culling practice on them, something like Tasmanian Devil is wholly protected and so ultimately doesn't and things, so I thought all native animals were protected. Yeah, look, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Chris, and I think... Um, Could you uh, control that elephant in the room? Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 do, I'll, do, I'll do my best. Thanks. <laughs> so, you know, I think that there are actually a number of um, protections and legal protections that actually uh, exist in um, uh, in Tasmania, in fact, more broadly across Australia, to actually uh, protect uh, native animals. And um, 
animals that are classified as rare, endangered, um, and even extinct actually have even further protection um, uh, put uh, put upon them. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, uh, as, as we all know, that um, uh, Section Forty Two of uh, that Protection Act uh, um, says, you know, basically that uh, it's illegal to threaten the survival of a rare or endangered species of flora or fauna, um, or to prejudice any measures taken or proposed to be taken for the management or protection of rare and endangered species of flora or fauna. Un so, only you would be able to pull up Section 42 at the drop of a hat. Yeah, well, I've also got 36, 39 and uh, 35 <laughs> in, uh, in front of me uh, as well. But uh, um, but you know, they, they are important because of the fact that uh, this is what actually... Uh, uh, protects the uh, um, the animal in uh, if it's discovered at uh, mm -hmm. you know, ten o'clock tonight um, that it is uh, wholly protected, and then as soon as uh, that's that's known, anyone going out there to try and film it or um, to you know collect evidence of it or whatnot is potentially at risk of prosecution as a result of that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, revealing its location, for example, um, could actually uh, be something that uh, um, endangers the protection that uh, the government would actually put in place to actually uh, um, to keep it uh, keep it hidden. So, um, so a lot of those um, those things are already in place. Sure, and that sort of further to that, you've got uh, the next point of closure of selected forest roads to unnecessary traffic. I suppose that would depend very much on where the thylacine was discovered. Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, you've got to, um, the state still has to continue to operate. And I think that whilst a lot of sighting reports happen with people driving their cars at night, in fact, that's the majority of sightings, a lot of them are actually on um, tarred or bitumen yeah. roads. Uh, so. Um, you're not going to close uh, those down. So, and it does lead me back to my favourite point that there has not been a thylacine hit by a vehicle that we know of, Christopher. That we know. Of. Okay, sorry. That officially I... there hasn't been a thylacine struck by a vehicle. Hmm. Hmm. I think so... we covered another podcast, did we not? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So cue uh, suspicious uh, music uh, now. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. The, the final main point is uh, formation of action group or committee of informed people to prepare and activate a detailed recovery schedule as quickly as possible. And, excuse me, Tiger Man has outlined the proposal. Uh, I, I, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, I guess the, the only problem is is that uh, half of the people uh, on that list are now dead, but... Um, in concept, uh, I, th I agree with the idea. <laughs> yes. Um, that's right. So Gyla, fact, Gyla dead would still know more about thylacine than you, Warren. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't <laughs> doubt that uh, for a second. Um, but uh, interestingly that... Uh, uh, there's a combination of uh, private citizens per se um, and uh, government representatives. I think it's a, a great idea. I can't actually see it sort of happening. I think uh, it would be government controlled, but I think a management committee would be sort of encompassing all different stakeholders would be ideal. I yep. can't see it happening in practice, but great idea. Yeah, look, absolutely, and I think it goes to actually, you know, how would you actually go through that process of actually confirming that the animal is uh, is still extant, uh, getting the right people in the know, um, and then setting up that particular committee structure, mm -hmm. uh, because you'd probably want to do most of that in a clandestine sort of fashion before you actually made any sort of media release, and this is also what he talks about in here about having a, a structured release to the media so that you could sell the rights to, to that information to actually fund the mm. recovery of the animal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, all in all, it does present some good points. 
Uh, it's a little bit outdated, and uh, sort of if you rebooted it, renewed it, uh, it's got some tremendously good points in it. Mm, mm, for sure. So uh, moving on. Sorry, Bill. I didn't say anything. Okay. I'm just sitting here looking gorgeous. <laughs> Fail. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> Fail. So moving on. Uh, who wants to lead out with TRU's news? Well, uh, I'll uh, I'll start, Chris. But um, as we've uh, we've hinted at uh, on a number of occasions, and we certainly discussed a little bit on the expanded perspectives uh, uh, podcast, uh, TRU um, has been working with uh, um, a, a couple of production companies in uh, in Australia to produce two one-hour documentaries on the Tasmanian tiger and excitingly on the 6th of September and 14th uh, the, for our friends in Scandinavia and Eastern Europe that's right so the the show is uh, is airing so in the UK so all those people who are listening to this podcast you'll be able to tune into Animal Planet on the 6th of September and see the hunt for the Tasmanian tiger um, featuring uh, Bill Flowers, Chris Copeland and Warren Darrow yeah. Did we? Shit, I can't remember. Hi. Did we catch? Did we catch that? Well, we can't let any spoilers out. That's for <laughs> no, sure. We can't say what we found, can we? Yeah, yeah. But uh, I guess uh, whilst we're certainly uh, biased on it, um, you know, we've certainly seen the final product, and we're very uh, happy with the with the outcome and the production quality um, of the of the final product. So. So we believe it's going to go Europe, Asia, Australia, and its performance based on whether it goes to the States or not. So fingers crossed uh, it ends up going to the American market. Yeah, and then uh, depending on how that goes and whether, I guess, we're interested and whether the, the TV peeps are interested as to, to whether we make any uh, any more episodes. So. Uh, awesome opportunity and uh, if you're uh, listening to this in the UK and other parts of Europe 6th of September and 14th of September check out TRU's uh, Thylacine documentary yeah so that uh, we're talking directly to the likes of the Alison Moody's the Dean Alex's the Steve Brigginshaw's um, that are out there tell all your friends uh, make sure that uh, that everybody you know is watching uh, the hunt for the Tasmanian tiger. Because it's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yes, even even with Bill in it. Yeah, <laughs> that only detracts from it slightly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I thought yeah. we found some interesting things without giving away any spoilers. Yeah, and I think that uh, both the... Uh, the, the skeptic, the scientist, and the uh, hardcore believers. There's something in in it uh, for for everybody. I think. Absolutely. Mm. Make sure you check it out. And uh, mm. again, moving on. Time for a uh, brand new sort of uh, segment. Ultimately, uh, it's our first interview. Warren, you uh, conducted this interview, so why don't you introduce him? Yeah, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, we had the great pleasure of interviewing the creator of the Great Search for the Thylacine uh, Facebook page, uh, Kristen Edwards. So we spoke to, to Kristen about a week ago. Um, so uh, stay tuned and uh, what's to follow is uh, our chat with Kristen. Hope you enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, for your listening pleasure this evening or wherever, if it's in the morning where you are, we have our very first guest on TRU's podcast, a lady who hails all the way from Ontario, Canada, the creator of the Thylacine Interest page, the great search for the Thylacine, Kristen Edwards. Kristen, how are you? And thank you for joining us today. Thanks. I'm doing good tonight. Awesome. So, Kristen, your uh, your page, the Great Search for the Thylacine, it's got seven hundred and seventy eight members. That's an awesome uh, amount of people. It's probably one of the largest uh, uh, special interest group pages that I've seen. 
how did you start the page and and when did you first get interested uh, in the thylacine? Well, I um, decided to get the page up as soon as I um, joined Facebook, maybe about five or six years ago. And um, my interest in the thylacine started about 1998 on a trip to London, England to see the specimen at the London Museum. Yeah. And, and what was it about the thylacine that, uh, that captured your, your interest? Well, when it said that it was extinct, I thought... That's kind of a shame to have such a beautiful animal be extinct. And then yeah. I did more research, did more research and stuff about the sightings and whatnot. Yeah, and so I guess lots of people would have had had seen the exact same specimen that you have in in the London Museum there, and and so heard the story. But not many people would have uh, then taken the the next leap to to create the page that you have. So what do you think it, it was about the animal that captured your attention so much? Just something about the way it looked, the stripes. The fact there's a marsupial, but it looked so much like a dog. It was just very different from anything else I've seen. Yeah. And um, I guess that uh, the description of your page is that uh, um, that the page is for uh, the, a group of people that believe that the Tasmanian tiger is still out there yep. uh, the, and to allow people to share news and pictures and those sorts of things. So what is it that makes you think that the thylacine is still out there? You mentioned you did some research. What, what research was that? Well, just a general search on the animal. But um, then I've read that people have seen footprints and there's been sightings and there's been some kills of animals that seem like they could be done by a thylacine. Yeah. And so the, the page has been up for a while. Um, have there been uh, – what's, what's the best thing about the page in, in your view? Just people uh, sharing their experiences, and if they've they've uh, seen footprints or, or they've heard something in the bush or whatnot. Yeah, has it been anything that's been posted on the page uh, in particular where you've thought, well, wow, that's that's super exciting, that's super interesting. Probably the footprints. Yeah. Wait, in- yep. Yep, and so and have over the time have you developed a little bit of uh, expertise yourself about being able to assess what's a good footprint and what's not a good footprint? Yep, sometimes sometimes it's really hard if it's been raining and stuff, but a lot of times I can tell the difference between a thylacine and a dog or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, it's uh, it's certainly um, uh, a topic that uh, sparks a lot of debate and interest and those sorts of things. So. Now the other thing that uh, that you do and you put up on your on your Facebook page is these uh, these videos and some of them are, are quite haunting and uh, so can yep. you tell us about them? Yeah, it's just um, sometimes I hear a piece of music and it really reminds me of the thylacine, scene. So I just try and um, match the best pictures up to that type of music and um, go with that sort of feeling. Yeah, and um, what? How many videos uh, have you got on your uh, on your YouTube page? Probably about 15, 20. Yep. And what's the, the most successful one that you've, you've got there? The first one was called The Phantoms of Tasmania, and that one's done the best. How many hits has that got? About half a million. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I hope you've monetized that and you're getting uh, the, uh, um, the, the YouTube checks for all those hits. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so do you have any other uh, videos uh, in mind? I just um, just depends on my mood, what I feel like putting together and stuff. Mm, mm. I'm working on one right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, um, is it uh, okay to ask what the topic of that is, or is it uh, uh, a secret at this stage? Oh no, it's not a secret. It's just um, it's not completely finished. Though I don't always like to reveal until I'm completely done. Yeah. Yep. No worries at all. Um, okay, so you've been interested in the thylacine for about six years or so, I think. Is uh, um, is that right? So Probably about 15 years altogether, but the page has been up for about six years. Yeah, okay. And so have you ever thought about uh, going out there and uh, having a look for yourself? I'd love to one day, yes. Yeah, so uh, get out in the in the wilderness. Where where would you go? Where where, where do you think uh, the most likely place to find a thylacine would be? Probably north uh, east Tasmania. North east Tasmania. Of, yeah, it seems to have a lot of sightings in that area. Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, the other thing that I'm not sure how aware of uh, the work uh, that we do that you are, but we we get out and do some experiments and also all those sorts of things and and try to come up with new ideas. 
have you thought of any you know experiments or things that uh, you would like to do that maybe that we could try while we're out in the field well there's always uh, night cams which do have some success for wildlife and stuff yeah and um uh, i guess the uh, the the real thing about that is is that um you know certainly cameras are a mainstay of what we have is this uh, view is that there's all these cameras out there and yet we don't get any um, any pictures? Uh, you, what w what would you think that the reason for that would be? Maybe they're a little bit spooky in certain areas, so they might not always come out. Yeah, yeah. So, in in your research uh, that you you've done, and I know some of your videos, you've got uh, various facts and uh, and figures about thylacines. Is there any particular sighting that you think is is more promising than any other not really no nothing in particular i just like to see what's out there yeah yeah okay um so let's uh talk about um uh, uh a few other sort of um topics when, when you're going out and so say people are in your position and they they want to go out and start investigating um, the thylacine and learning more what what advice would you give them where should they start looking start probably looking in the well fields and stuff because they really like the open fields yeah more than the yep yeah what about when it comes to doing uh research in terms of uh, you know learning uh about the history of the thylacine and and uh the facts uh what are there any particular books that you like or uh, uh or web pages those sorts of things I like the Thylacine Museum. It's probably my favorite, me my favorite website. Yeah, do you go there often? Do you? Yep. 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 Okay. Um, so, uh, I guess the other thing is, is that uh, um, that we're always trying to do from TRU side is to answer people's sort of questions. And and uh, you know, the, are there any particular questions that uh, you'd like to pose to the team that you know we, that we could potentially answer or do some research on to um, that would, you know, uh, I guess, uh, um, fill any gaps in, in your knowledge or just general things that uh, you think people might be interested in? Well, I like um, plaster casts of footprints. That's probably my favourite. Yeah, yeah. And what, what particular um, things about uh, plaster casts? Uh, I know that we've got a range of uh, plaster casts and yep. we've, been seen, we've been shown lots and lots and lots uh, over the years and uh, whatnot. So what is it about uh, those plaster casts that, uh, um, that you like? A lot of them look quite uh, authentic and that they couldn't really be anything else. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if you've, if you've seen that uh, on our webpage, we've got a, uh, a new section now that's called Examining the Evidence and we've put up um, uh, a whole heap of, uh, of things like uh, plaster plaster casts um, uh, drawings of uh, of feet some of the things from um, the thylacine museum there's links to, to a lot of the books that are in there but also uh, we've got access to some of the uh, the official um, uh, ready reckoners that were given to to the rangers in the field um, in the early 80s so if you go to the tasmanian museum and art gallery there's a thylacine sighting kit that they have there and it's on display. So um, you might be aware of the hands nodding uh, sighting. Well, yep. after the hands nodding sighting, as part of their investigation, the, the Parks and Wildlife Branch actually put a kit together for all of the rangers out uh, in the various parts of Tasmania to allow them to uh, assess whether uh, this evidence uh, that they'd just come across or someone reported a sighting, whether that it was potentially thylacine. And in that, there's a number of things that um, that uh, allow you to assess uh, uh, thylacine footprints. And so we've put a number of those things up on the website in terms of angles and all sorts of things and you know, how you can draw things. So um, I certainly sort of recommend that um, that you have a, have a look at that. So if you haven't already, that is. Oops. So ne next difficult question for you. Of, all, of the three TRU members, which one's your favourite uh, uh, member? Oh, <laughs> that's kind of a tough one, isn't it? Yeah, look, and <laughs> it, it, it's it's okay not to say Bill, right? I know that uh, Bill <laughs> Bill prattles on about his beard all the time, so it's probably there you enough. Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so are you aware of our skeptometer system in terms of the way that we um, we give a rating on um, various pieces of evidence that we see out of ten? 
Uh, yes, I have seen that. Yeah, so what we'd like to get from you is your skeptometer rating where one is, uh, uh, or zero is uh, um, very unlikely and 10 is absolutely certain. Um, what, what's your skeptometer rating for the continued existence of the thylacine? Definitely 10. Definitely 10? What makes yep. you, what, why would you say that? There's just been way too many things and way too much evidence over the years for it not to be out there. Yeah. And what would you say to, uh, to, the, to the skeptics that are out there saying, you know, that would say the exact opposite to, to that? It's, it's a zero. Well, it's pretty hard to change people's minds, of course, by them. You know, they can always look up at your site and, and see what's up there, and they can decide for themselves as well. Yeah. And uh, when, you, when, you're, um, when you're running your, your page there, because you get a, a great group of people in, uh, in there, are there any frustrations that you have with, uh, with that? Because, you know, people are people, and there's, yeah, for, everybody's got their own individual personality. Are there any issues that, uh, um, that you have from time to time? Well, there's been some issues in the past with people fighting and stuff, but the um, after a while they seem to sort it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's funny um, uh, that people come to the um, the these pages for a common interest, and and they end up sort of uh, fighting. It's sort of uh, amusing in some ways, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> Belto four. Yep. Okay. Do you have any other suggestions for podcasts? I think um, having conflicting ideas, like if some people really don't believe and then some people really believe and, and they can have their arguments either way, why they do and why they don't believe. Yeah, yeah. So almost having a bit of a, a debate. Um, yeah. So um, what, what are your plans for getting uh, out in the field yourself? What do you reckon? Is that, is that a, a near-term goal or a long-term goal? Oh, it would be quite a long-term goal at this point but um you yeah. know, never say never <laughs> never say now it's a long flight can you just uh, let us know um so people out there what uh, your channel name is for your youtube channel so if they're interested in your videos they can go and have a look at it yeah they can just look up both of four and that's my uh, account okay thanks very much Kristen, um for for joining us on the podcast yep. um and we'll talk to you soon yep thank you have a good night Yeah, well, that was a very good interview with Kristen, and uh, it's nice to know who her favourite TRU member is. She has very good taste. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it uh, uh, is interesting indeed, isn't it? Um, yeah. She sounds like a very intelligent lady to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not, not that you're biased, William. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, but we've, we've all got uh, weaknesses, so, uh, yeah, but... Uh, it's really interesting, isn't it, that uh, all the way over in Canada, uh, uh, Kristen's walked into um, a museum, seen uh, uh, a thylacine taxidermy specimen and become captivated by it in such a way that she's then set up this, uh, uh, this Facebook page and you know, it's got 776 members, so that's uh, pretty, uh, pretty big. And one of her, her videos about the thylacine's got a quarter of a million hits, so... That's uh, that's pretty big uh, coverage of thylacine. Absolutely. So, good on to uh, Kristen, and uh, thanks for participating in uh, our first interview. And we're going to be seeking uh, more interviewees down the track. Absolutely. So, if anybody's got any suggestions on people we'd like to, or uh, we think that uh, would be good to interview, please let us know. I think the only real caveat is is. Um, that they need to have access uh, to a technology like Skype so that we can actually uh, uh, conduct the interview. But uh, I think you know there's a lot of people who uh, who fit into that category. So uh, let yeah. us know who you'd like us to talk to. And the other caveat is that you got to put up with Warren. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or maybe. <laughs> or, or me by special request. Yeah, or Bill by special request. Yeah. Warren just suggested that you have to actually be able to use Skype, so that rules you out. I'm yeah. here. <laughs> He's here, isn't he? That's right. Give the, give the guy a break. No. Even I can use Skype. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enough said. Most, most of the time. About, I suppose about 70% of the time I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I'm surprised Skype aren't using that in all their commercials. <laughs> Even Bill Flowers can use Skype. Yeah.
Mm. Well, on that note, we should uh, probably wrap this gift up. Yeah, so uh, really varied podcast uh, tonight, guys. So unpacking the Magnificent Survivor stuff. So there's probably some more room for us to come back and actually have a look at some of the content uh, of uh, uh, Magnificent Survivor and his learnings and uh, the evidence that he puts forward at a later date. But then a uh, great interview with uh, Kristen and, of course, the big news. What was that big news again, Chris? September 6 in uh, UK and uh, other parts of Europe in September 14, the uh, Tasmanian Tiger documentary by the one and only TRU. Make sure you check it out. Yep. The Hunt for the Tasmanian Tiger, it's called, guys. Okay. Check your local guides. Check your local guides. <laughs> All right. So uh, we will uh, select from uh, the sort of Facebook page what the topic for the... Uh, Next podcast will be. There's been some magic suggestions, and we'll wade through it, and uh, we'll uh, knock another one out uh, in the very near future. Guys, uh, thanks for your time and your participation, and thanks to our listeners. Tru out. Do, do I press Cheers, this everybody. thing? I'm not sure how to get out of this. I'm, Skype's confusing me. Bye bye. <laughs>